Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. I have been trying to get all my ducks in a row lately, and one of the ducks that I keep wanting to get in a row that I can't seem to get in a row is trying to answer all the patrons' questions that you guys have emailed me. And in the, I'm going to do a, a push. It's like a, a pre... Um, uh, New Year's New Year's resolution to like address every single patron question that's ever been sent to me because <laughs> I have this every time a patron sends me a question I I put it in a word doc and and I say okay well I'll get to that at some point and then so I, I just have this really long word doc so what I was thinking was I just sort of power through them real fast so um, which of course will never happen because when I get on a topic. Um, things blossom. But this is the Psychology and Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Hanna. I'm a therapist and I'm also a professor. This first patron question is from a uh, patron. I don't know if I should say the names of uh, a, a woman patron. She writes in, can you talk about erotic countertransference? What should the client feel about it? Where does sexual desire come from? So erotic countertransference is when a therapist has uh, sexual attraction or feelings, maybe even romantic feelings for their clients. So she says, can you talk about erotic, erotic countertransference? What should the client feel about it? Where does that sexual desire come from? What happens to the therapy when the therapist admits to having erotic countertransference? Does the client have the right to feel special? What is the difference between simple attraction and erotic countertransference? It seems to me th that the field is trying to hide behind the notion of countertransference as to invalidate any feelings between therapist and client. How does it impact the therapy? What does it start? When does it start to really damage the client? It seems that some clients would genuinely want sexual contact with a therapist and would not be damaged by it. I know you've you, you've just done a podcast on erotic countertransference, so making another one so soon may not be the plan. Well, as always, patron, your wish is my command, so let's get into this. Well, yeah, I have done a number of episodes, most, most notably uh, December 23 called Sexual Attraction and Therapy, uh, 15, 2015, and then I have December 21, 2016, Therapists Attracted to Clients. And this episode might come out in December of 18. So it seems like every December I talk about erotic countertransference in some way in the last few years. Uh, a brief history, you know, I, in those other, other episodes, I do a more detailed history. But um, just some notable things is in the beginning, the, a lot of prominent figures in, psycho, in the beginning of psychotherapy, including women psychoanalysts, noted that they had sexual attraction for their patients and would take that to the next level, even having sex with their clients and even marrying their clients. And again, even prominent women psychoanalysts back in the day uh, would do this as well. Most notably, the very first talk therapist, Joseph Breuer, who was Freud's mentor to some extent, he uh, was attracted to the infamous client Anna O. Oh. Freud warned people about it. He, Freud seemingly didn't suffer from this the way that everyone else was seemingly at the time. But it's been a mostly ignored topic in the field um, for, you know, just uh, re research has found in my own anecdotal uh, life would, has found that people will graduate from training programs having never talked about it in graduate school or, or having extremely limited discussions around it. And when, whenever graduate programs talk about it, in my experience, you know, they'll talk about it for a bit, but because it's so fraught with weird culture and our puritanical American notions, it, it, erotic countertransference requires a lot of discussion. I have found as a, as a trainer and supervisor and educator, I have found that when it comes to things that are highly culturally charged, you have to have very long discussions around it. You know, it's sort of like the notion that with trainees, you would say, hey, you know, racism is bad and, and all of us have racist notions. So let's talk about it for 15 minutes and then we'll never talk about it again. Well, most of us would say, well, that's not enough time. You, you need way more than 15 minutes. You, you got to read about it. You got to talk about it. You got to think about it. You got to write about it. You got to 
practice. You got to get some perspective. You got to go out into the world and investigate. You got to, you know, read more and talk more and think more and get confronted. You know, it's a long process in terms of as a therapist, understanding racism, how it affects you, how it affects other people, how it affects your, you know, your therapy. Well, erotic countertransference is one of those things that's, if it's talked about, it's barely talked about. And again, because it's so fraught with weird culture in America, it, it, it often, the little bit that you talk about it basically means you're not talking about it. Okay. So, um, well, let's look at some statistics. Uh, I, a lot of the data I have is from this one really large scale study from 1998. And I suspect that the, even though that was uh, 20 years ago, I suspect that the stats are very similar to today. Um, a lot of studies, when they look at the field of psychotherapy, the statistics don't really change that much over the last 20 years. And so I suspect this is, but anyway, there's a study in 1998 and they asked male and female therapists if they had ever been attracted to their clients and 98% of male therapists and 86% of female therapists reported that they had been attracted to a client at some point in their career. So basically all male therapists and the vast majority of female therapists report, yeah, at some point I was attracted to a client. Uh, but what about frequent thoughts? Well, 21% of male therapists and 11% of female therapists reported that they frequently have attraction, you know, sexual attraction feelings for their clients. So again, 21% of male therapists and about 11% of female therapists reported that they frequently feel attraction for their clients. So uh, you know, female therapists reporting less of this, but, you know, quite a bit of it. Maybe that's surprising. Maybe it's not. So given that it's so common, why are we not talking about it more? That's my big thesis in all the episodes I've talked about it. In terms of my own anecdotal experience, yeah, I've talked with many therapists who have felt attracted to their clients. Um, some, and I, and I know some therapists personally who seem to be attracted to their clients often. There's, there's certain therapist that I know well, who will, will basically indicate or give signs that if they have, you know, if, if they have a client who's even, you know, somewhat uh, attractive to them, they will notice that they have sexual attractions, uh, sexual attraction feelings for that, for that client. It's not a bad thing. It's just, it's, a, it's interesting that some people experience a lot more of it. Um, now, as I've talked about in other episodes, for some reason, I've never been sexually attracted to a client. Apparently, I'm one of those 2% of people. If I, if you gave me a, you know, if I was one of the respondents to that 1998 survey, I, and they asked me, you know, have you ever been sexually attracted to a client at some point in your career? I would say, no, I just, I've just never, I mean, maybe some, something unconscious, I suppose, anything's possible there, but but when I talk with other therapists who experience sexual attraction for their clients, I hear them describe something that I've just never experienced. Now, I'm not, there's nothing special about me. I have all the other forms of countertransference, you know, the, 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 you know, millions of other experiences that one can have regarding countertransference, um, uh, both shameful and otherwise. But for whatever reason, I, I don't have erotic countertransference for my, for my clients. I, the, the only thing I can think of is that I just really, when I'm with a client, I really identify with the professional role. I, I, I take it very seriously. You know, I, it's a mode that I go into that I take very seriously. It's not like a client walks in my office and it's just like, oh, let's just chit chat. You know, it's, I, I'm very, I'm, I'm, it's a very, precise sort of mode that I get into where I'm like really listening. I'm really paying attention to them. I'm really thinking about my own, my own countertransference and I'm really trying to help them. And my guess is that that mode is so counter to any sexual feelings one would have that I just don't experience that. I, I imagine that if I was a lot looser, I suppose, with my role, I would 
probably feel more erotic countertransference. I don't know. Just speculation there. Okay, so let's go into some of your questions here, patron. You ask, what should the client feel about erotic countertransference? So this is assuming that the therapist has told the client about their feelings toward the client. So what should the client feel about it? Well, you're, you're free to feel whatever you want. And it, if the relationship is going to be therapeutic, you, you would want to explore and express how you did feel about it. And the therapist uh, should listen with empathy to that. So, you know, if you felt repulsed by it or you felt also attracted or you felt indifferent about it, the, you know, as a client, you, that's the whole point of therapy. You're supposed to be able to feel whatever you want. Uh, another question here is, where does that sexual desire come from? Well, it's, you know, many, many places. Um, uh, in some instances, it's probably just a normal attraction. The way that you might see someone on the street and be like, oh, I'm sexually attracted to that person. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I think we can all imagine what that would feel like. Also, I would imagine that erotic countertransference coming, comes from getting to know someone really well. The closer you get to someone, the more likelihood that that's going to sneak out, I suppose. Also, uh, a misunderstanding of your professional role. I think that, you know, is in line with how I think about the reason why I don't have it is because I feel like I'm very consistent with my understanding of what my role is. Um, I've, I've just always, I don't know, from the very beginning, there's certain things that I absolutely struggle with as a therapist, but one of them is, has never really been confusion about what I'm doing. When I, I remember early as a very young novice therapist, I would talk with my peers and they would say like, man, you know, I'm, I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming about my clients and I'm worrying about my clients at night. And, you know, I just, I don't know what to do. And I, and I would say, I would think in my mind that, that I just don't have that. I've never, I've never brought my home, my work home with me. I, I try as hard as I can with my clients and as soon as I'm done with that, I just move on with my life because what else can I do? You know, if, if I worrying about them isn't going to help and they probably don't want me to destroy my life because I'm worried about them. I do think about my clients for sure. I do, do think about them occasionally. I mean, our relationships can be quite intense, but I don't, it doesn't plague me, you know? And I think part of that is because I just really understand what my role is. My, my role is not to save these people's lives. My role is not to be responsible to, you know, to, for them. My, my role is to give it my all for 55 minutes and write up the progress note and then I'm done. You know, that, that's my role. Um, I, another reason why some therapists would be sexually attracted to their, to their clients, I think is because they lack sex and or romance in their personal life. And we all have needs for sex and for romance. And when we don't have that, it might, uh, that need might manifest in ways that, uh, it, it you know, what, you know, in Jurassic Park, it's like nature will find a way, right? Well, if you are a therapist and you're not cultivating romance and sex in your personal life, nature will find a way, right? Also, I think that some people, some therapists have sexual compulsions. They, for whatever reason, trauma or a medication or um, whatever, they, they have a compulsion for sex and will experience much more uh, attraction and motivation in that area. Also, another place that it comes from is from a reenactment. When, uh, you know, therapists, the whole idea of countertransference is that it comes from some vulnerability or some trauma or some difficulty in your own life as a therapist. And, and in the same way that clients will recreate their past difficult relationships in the therapeutic relationship, so will, so will therapists. So if you were sexually exploited yourself as um, a, as a therapist, you might recreate that dynamic with your clients. Also, like I said, trauma is trauma can cause a lot of interesting experiences, including being sexually attracted to people where it's not such a great idea. Projective identification comes into play here and on and on and on. I mean, I, I could just, I could talk for hours about where erotic countertrans might come from, uh, but we will move forward here. 
you have another question here. What happens to the therapy when the therapist admits to having erotic countertransference? So, uh, so again, what happens to the therapy when the therapist admits to having erotic countertransference to the client? Well, sky's the limit. Some clients will be creeped out about it and run. I, I've heard people say that. Some clients will just be confused. It's like, wait, what? Um, some clients will actually like it. They'll be like, ooh, you know, my therapist is attracted to me. That's That's kind of nice. Makes me feel... Like I'm an attractive person and that's, that's, you know, that makes me feel good about myself. Uh, some clients will try to ignore it. And again, the, the sky's the limit in terms of the different reactions that a client might have. Um, in my anecdotal experience, I'll tell you that most, the, most of the clients that I, it's usually clients that will talk with me about this. They will be, uh, well, so I've heard a few, I've heard a few different things. I've heard some some clients will tell me, look, when my therapist said that, it completely creeped me out. And pretty quickly, I decided I didn't want to work with that therapist anymore. Or uh, another thing that'll happen is, actually, I should mention this, is like, because someone actually emailed me about this recently, is the therapist will actually terminate because of it. So because a lot of people don't really know how to deal with it, when a therapist admits that they have erotic, you know, sexual feelings for their client, they'll go home and they'll think about it and they'll be like, oh, I have to terminate. And then they'll very quickly terminate and it'll be really bad for the client because the client will be suddenly abandoned by their therapist. I hear that too. Um, but anyway, so let's move on. Uh, I, I actually recommend that client, that therapists, when they notice that they have sexual attraction for their clients, for a client, that they should consult pretty heavily about that. They should seek out supervision or consultation with someone who knows what they're talking about and explore the issue and also explore whether or not it's best to tell the client. This is in contrast to kind of an old school recommendation to always tell. There was this thing that I think it kind of grew out of the radical honesty movement in the 60s and 70s and the congruence movement and so a lot of therapists were like, look, you got to be radically honest with your clients to, to avoid crazy making behavior, to avoid incongruency, to model that it's okay to express your feelings. And really, you know, it's a nice idea, but when you actually put it into practice, it's not the best practice. If you have an, if you have an attraction to a client, you, you need to explore it with an appropriate person and explore the options. Maybe it's, maybe it's, you'll come to the conclusion that you really should tell the client for one reason or another, but just automatically telling the client is, is just really stupid in my, in my mind. It's like, you're, you're basing your therapy on a, something that's in dogma that doesn't really have any evidence. And so you should just be careful. It, it, you should be careful about any divulging of, of any sort of self-disclosure, especially something like that and of any so of any countertransference. So in my experience, the the attraction is often minor. The, the, the vast majority of times that I've heard other therapists talk about being attracted to their to their clients, it's it's very transient. It's very minor uh, and can easily be contained within consultation and uh, which means there's there's really no need to express it to the client. It's it's often temporary as well. Some, some clients might not like that. I think that the patron that wrote in it, from the tone of her email, I think she would be like, hey, I would want my therapist to tell me. And yeah, I get that. But take it from me, there's, there's a lot of things about therapy that make it so that therapists should just really be reflective around what they self-disclose and what they don't. Anyway, moving forward. Another question you have here, patron, does the client have the right to feel special? Does the client have the right to feel special? Of course. As I said earlier, the client has has the right and can feel whatever they want to and express whatever they want to express. Another question you have here, what is the difference between simple attraction and erotic countertransference? So the difference between just simple attraction and erotic countertransference. Well, in order to fully answer this question, I would have to talk for hours and hours about the history of the word countertransference, which is a long and winding road. 
In fact, you know, I recently published a book on supervision and the next book I'm going to write is on grief. And the next book after that is on countertransference. And uh, I have looked into the history and it is long. <laughs> uh, it is a long and winding road that goes again, all the way back to Breuer and Freud and maybe even beyond that. And a lot of prominent people have talked about it. So anyway, so it really, uh, so the gestalt of all that that I'll say is that it just depends on your definition of countertransference, of which there are many. But in a nutshell, for me, what I might say is that simple attraction is just regular attraction to another human being, right? That that doesn't have anything to do with anything, any vulnerability that you have. It's just like, it's just like, oh, you know, I'm attracted to that person because they're my type or something. Whereas erotic countertransference is the result of some vulnerability in the th in the in the therapist, such as tra traumatization or some defense mechanism that's sort of cropping up as sexual attraction or some reenactment from their life or something that that we would label countertransference. However, there are others, including myself, who might call any sex they might call re you know simple attraction. They might also call that erotic countertransference because countertransference. I, I use it interchangeably. Sometimes I the definition for countertransference that I use is basically any feeling that a therapist has for a client. And then other times I use the definition that it's only feelings related to vulnerability. Just as a sort of gro you know, crude example is if a client punches you in the face and you feel hurt and angry about it, that's not countertransference. That's just a normal reaction to being punched in the face, right? So countertransference, by its definition, is is counter to transference and has to do with your own unconscious, unresolved issues, at least according to one definition. Okay, another thing you say here is, it seems to me that the field of psychotherapy is trying to hide behind the notion of countertransference as to invalidate any feelings between therapist and client. And what I say to that is, yeah, perhaps. Um, but you know, what's the alternative that that we validate feelings between therapist and client? Because in most states, it's illegal for therapists to have sex with a client. It's not. It's not just unethical. It's actually, you know, codified in state law that you will be prosecuted for a crime. Maybe it's a felony. Not sure if you have sex sexual contact with a client. So. It's a very serious thing, and the reason why we have all made that illegal, or many states have made that illegal, is because research shows that it is almost always a bad thing. Now, this patron, you're not talking about ha actually having sex with a with between a therapist and a client, but what I'm saying is, what would be exactly the reason for my field to say it's it's a valid, I don't know, lifestyle choice to to be attracted to a, a client and to express that and to allow that to be um, in the room. I'm not saying that's all, that's that should always be avoided. It, I think there are a minority of situations where it actually is therapeutic overall for a therapist to confess those feelings to a client. But in my experience, that's pretty rare. It, the people who actually do divulge it, in my opinion, they are often subconsciously they're trying to get something going with their client. They're they're saying, mm, you know, the part of them wants to either either sabotage their career or again they have no sexual uh, satisfaction in their regular life, and they are there's a part of them that wants to get something going with their clients, and. I mean, at the very least, they want to have some kind of minor flirtation, in my opinion. Now, again, I can't, you know, confirm that scientifically, but but it's a it's a it's a need on behalf of the therapist that's being that's being communicate that's being um, that the therapist is trying to meet, and it's at the expense of the client, oftentimes, because as I said, most of the time the client is not happy about being told. There, are, I've heard. I've just, you know, I'm a lightning rod for these stories. I've heard so many stories of women clients telling me that their male therapist confessed to a sexual attraction to them, and they were completely creeped out by it. They were surprised. You know, they're like, 
I'm I'm a 27 year old woman, and this guy's like I don't know 55 years old. Why why is he attracted to me? It's disgusting, you know. So now we don't want to shame sexual attraction, but we do want to look critically at the practice at confessing these feelings to a client. Uh, and there's lots of different negative effects that I've heard and that the research has found that clients will experience. The client will feel ex- ex- exploit- exploited or shamed. Have I been saying exploited? Exploited? <laughs> That's like orientated. Anyway, um, exploited. Exploited? Anyway, Ugh. Um, the client might terminate early. I've heard a lot of that. The client's like, you know what? He creeped me out. I'm going to quit. <laughs> um, the client never, might never go to therapy again. They might be like, that was disgusting. And are all therapists creeps? Therefore, I'm never going to therapy again. When, it, it can result in actual traumatization. For a client to be opening up and trusting a therapist and trying to find safety, and for that therapist to say, you know what? I want to have sex with you. I have feelings. I have sexual feelings for you. I I want to have sex with you. <laughs> yeah, it was the implication there, right? There are many people who, men and women clients, who would be very much scared of that interaction. They'd just be like, uh, that's terrifying. That, you know, what does this mean? Does this mean that my therapist might hurt me or something? It's it's a it's a scary situation for pe- for some people. There also it's a slippery slope to illegal and ex- exploitative behavior. That's that word. Is it exploitative? Exploitative, but exploited. <laughs> Learned something new every day. Um, also, research has found, as I said, that if it results in actual sexual contact that it's almost always detrimental to both people, but mainly we're concerned about the client. Uh, PTSD is extremely likely to happen to the client. Although I will say there are some rare cases where the sexual contact would actually uh, seemingly work out fine for both people. Um, There are cases where people will say, yeah, you know, me and my therapist, we started to be attracted to each other. And then one thing led to another and boom, you know, we were dating and then we were having sex and, and I I never went to therapy with him again, but, um, yeah, you know, we dated for six months. It was fine. And so there are stories like that. I've, you know, I've heard a lot of different stories. Okay. Moving on. Another question, how does it impact the therapy? Well, as I've been saying, you know, it really depends, but it often, I mean, actual sex with the client usually goes bad, but there's not a lot of research in terms of that or any research that I found that tried to measure the outcomes of therapists that decided to disclose it as opposed to therapists who decided not to disclose it. So I I don't know. I, I could see it going all the different ways that I've been talking about. And your final question here is, when does it start to really damage the client? Well, if the client feels bad about it, then it that's that's damage there, right? If the client loses trust in the therapy, if the client loses trust in therapy in general, if the client is afraid, if the client feels kind of creeped out or even abused in some ways, then then that's when it can really damage damage the client. The the other thing here that I haven't talked about is that the client I could totally imagine a client at first being like, "Oh, that's flattering." And, oh, that, that makes me feel kind of good because it makes me feel like the therapist is not just treating me like a, a number. I'm, a, I'm an actual human being to this therapist. And they're, they're having feelings related to me that are, that are very much just human to human. And that, that makes me feel even more safe. Well, over time, that, that reaction might change from the client. The client might slowly wonder, well, what else is going on in the therapist's mind? And th- is the therapist really listening to me because they care or they only listen to me because they're sexually attracted to me? There, there's all these weird questions that could come into mind later on that I've actually heard from clients before. So uh, it's, it's a complex issue. And I hope that answers your question, patron. Okay, so let's take a break. And when we get back, I'll read some more patron emails. What do you say?
All right, we're back from the break. This month's episode are are this month's episodes are brought to you by Talkspace.com. It's an online therapy outfit. You want to use the promo code Kirk K I R K. When you go to Talkspace.com and you use the promo code Kirk, you get a discount, and you also signal to Talkspace that you're one of my listeners. And we only need like a few people to sign up every month in order for them to continue being a sponsor. So if you're interested in it or you just want to experiment with it, please go to Talkspace.com, promo code Kirk. All right, let's go on to another email here. This is from patron Torleaf. He writes, One of my friends has lost her will to live. She has anorexia, she has lots of shame, and she has lots of body dysmorphia. She has stopped eating. Basically, she might be dead in a few weeks or less, and I know she needs professional help. Is there anything a friend can do? Is there anything a friend can do to get through to her? Or is it a lost cause? Are there things one can do at least to make things easier or raise the chances of survival? How are eating disorders generally treated? All right, patron Torleaf, these are very good questions. These are questions that therapists ask themselves as well. In a nutshell, uh, you know, there's a, there's a spectrum of severity of eating disorders. So some eating disorder, some presentations are mild, and some are moderate, and some are severe. From the sound of it, it sounds like your friend has a moderate to severe case. And when you have a moderate to severe case of, e- of an eating disorder, they are extremely entrenched disorders. It is very difficult to, to help someone in this situation, because, largely because the person may or may not want help, actually. They, they might not actually want to change. And, and that's something that, as a clinician, it took me a long time to learn. I had to treat a number of people with eating disorders to learn that they might come to therapy and they might say, yeah, I have an eating disorder, I want help. But when they go home, the they they have a battle between the side of them that wants to continue the eating disorder and, and the behaviors and the other side of them that wants to kick the habit. And when they go home, the eating, eating disorder side of them will win the battle a lot of times, even though when they're in session, the, shall we say, the healthy side of them will m- might be presenting itself, you know? So when I would treat people with eating disorders, I, I, would, I would work with them for weeks and months and years, and nothing would change. And their weight might just get worse and worse and worse. And it was then that I, over time I figured out, oh, this is more like an, an addiction. In that, it's not the same as an addiction by any means, but it's similar to an addiction in that when someone is, has an addiction to something, like heroin, for instance, or alcohol, or cigarettes, they often will have uh, extreme ambivalence as to whether or not they want to change. There's a part of them that definitely wants to quit smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol, but there's another part of them that that wants to continue using. And as a therapist, it's really distressing to be in a situation like that because we're used to clients who really want to change, you know? And so there's a lot, you're both on the same page. And when you have a client who is mostly not on the same page as you, then it's it's a weird place to be as a therapist. You end up having a lot of counter-transference around trying to convince the client that they should try harder to be healthy. And, it, and it's, not, it's not a good therapeutic situation to be in. So, you know, kicking the habit of an eating disorder, if I might phrase it that way, is probably just as hard, if not harder, than kicking a habit of, say, heroin. And that's something that, again, it took me a long time to learn because I don't have an eating disorder as a thing. And, and so, I, you know, there's certain things I can absolutely relate to, like anxiety. But when it comes to eating disorders, I just can't relate to it. So it took me a while to figure it out. And it, I had to treat a number of people with eating disorders to, to get wisdom around what the disorder actually is and what it is like interpsychically. You know, from the outside, it might seem easy to stop. You know, it's just like, hey, just stop, stop doing that. Eat, please. You know, if it's anorexia and they're restrictive, it's like, you know, just eat food. 
start eating. Stop, stop thinking weird thoughts like you're fat. You're, you're not fat. And even if you were, like it's not worth dying over, you know. But when you, when you actually get to know these folks, you realize it's much, much more than that. It's so entrenched. It, years ago, I got to the point where I just decided I would start referring these clients to, to people who specialize in eating disorders because I figured out that, one, I don't have the time to do all the casework that's required because you have to coordinate with the medical professionals and the day treatment center and the dietitian and the family oftentimes. And I, as a person who's in private practice, I just didn't have the resources for that. Um, the other reason why I stopped working with people with moderate to severe eating disorders is because I don't prefer working with clients who don't want to change. <laughs> um, I, I, I've, I've, you know, I've been a therapist for over 20 years and I've, I've treated tens of thousands of people, tens of thousands, well, thousands of people. And in the beginning of my career, most of my clients did not actually want to be in therapy. You know, they were teenagers or kids or adults that were kind of cajoled into it or something. And it was very hard to work with those kinds of people because they didn't really want my help. And they would sit down and be like, okay, what are we going to do today? Or they'd be kids that would try to avoid therapy by just playing with toys the whole time and not answering any questions and stuff. And and it's complex and there's ways of actually getting kids to engage in therapy. But the point is, is that uh, I, pu- I feel like I paid my dues in the beginning of my career for the first 10 or 15 years. And now I'm at the point where all of my clients, when they come to me in private practice, they're, they're, they're on board with therapy. You know, there's no ambivalence about it. And, and I, I don't know, I just, I like that phase of my career now. <laughs> and when it comes to the people who I treated with eating disorders, were extremely ambivalent about whether or not they wanted to change. And although they were lovely people and they came to therapy and they worked hard, it it was kind of um, difficult because there would be times when I'd be like, so, you know, there'd be a session where I would get a report from the medical professional and they'd be like, she she lost three pounds this week. And she's already small, you know, she's already like, 86 pounds or something and she, and she lost three more pounds. I mean, it's like, how do you do that? And I'd be looking at her and I'd, and I'd be like, um, you know, how are things going this week? And, and she'd be like, oh, you know, things are fine. And, I, and I'd be like, how, how is your eating? And she's like, oh yeah, I've been doing good. I've been following the plan. And then I'd say, well, I got this report from your, from your doctor, from your physician saying that they weighed you and you, you've lost three pounds. And the client would look at me and say, "Like, no, I didn't." And I'd be like, "Well, what do you mean, no?" You know, or they'd be, or they'd say, "Oh, well, you know, I, I'll, I'll get back on track." And we'd we'd talk, and then the next week they would have lost another couple pounds or something, and then we would talk again, and I and I, I felt like I was in this situation where I was like trying, I was like putting the client in a situation where they felt like they had to lie to me, and. There were times in my career where I felt like that's the sort of work I wanted to do. I wanted the challenge. I I wanted that sort of experience. And I'm at the point now where that's just not what I want to do. I'll I'll probably change at some point and maybe I'll start working with these folks again. But it's just it's just not where I'm at in my career right now. So I'm I'm telling you this because patron uh, Torleaf is that for therapists it's you know who work with these clients very intensely maybe two or three sessions a week it can be very distressing to feel that powerlessness to be like I am trying my hardest and nothing is working and I don't know what will work and all of my training and all of my wisdom and all of my uh, experience and, and all of my heart is in this and this person is continuing to lose weight and they could die. Every th- I'm putting everything I can into this and they might slip through my fingers and die. It is a terrible feeling to have as a, as a human being and 
as a friend and as a therapist, as a family member, to, to watch someone disintegrate in front of you when all they have to do is start eating. It's so simple. It's something that the, you know, most of us do all the time. In fact, most of us eat too much, you know, and, and to look at someone else and just be like, just, just eat, just eat, you know, a little bit. I I remember working with some clients trying to get them to eat 150 calories a day, just, just trying to get them to start eating a piece of cheese once a day, one bite of cheese or half of an apple. I, I remember just, you know, whole sessions talking about eating a, a satsuma orange, which is, you know, making my mouth water when I think about it, but it's probably like what, like a like 75 calories or something. And 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 knowing that, okay, if I can get this person to eat this one apple, we're you know what a what a wonderful rejoicing success that would be and that's not enough they can't eat only one apple a day they need so much more and and if it's so hard to have them not eat this one apple what's the hope you know it it you just feel powerless and of course the client is even more powerless right and they're uh, perhaps even more scared right so you ask a uh, patron, is there anything a friend can do? Well, it's the, the, the main thing that you should probably do is at the, at the at the best, actually, you could get a release somehow to speak with your friend's main mental health person. That would be the best thing you could do because you could coordinate your friendly efforts with the, with the treatment team. Uh, barring that, the best thing you can do is just be a, a, a good friend, you know, be there to listen, be there to have a laugh. Don't judge her. Don't pressure her. It's, it's so common to pressure people. If, if all it took was a little bit of pressure, they would have gone to therapy a long time ago. They would have, they would have changed a long time ago. Pressure implies that all the person needs is just a little encouragement. And it's, it's so much more entrenched than that. Now, if pressure works, then by all means do it. But unless you're pretty sure it's, it's going to work or unless it's minor pressure, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bother, you know, having an intervention or something, right? And, 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 or trying to drag her to a treatment center. It's just, it, if it works, then great, but it's not likely to work. You can absolutely suggest if they're not in treatment that they should be in treatment. You could try to connect them with a, with a treatment professional. You could maybe give them a brochure, or maybe even call professionals and, and get like their approach. And then you could communicate that to your friend and, and say like, you know, they sounded really nice. You should give them a call. You know, you can do that stuff, but don't count on it working is the thing. Cause again, it's, if that's all it took, eating disorders would not be the problem that they are in our society. You can, one of the best things you can do is actually talk with all of her other support people. You could contact her family, contact her friends, and uh, you, all of you could help each other out. One of the best things you can do in situations like this is to get the support system together and say, let's all work together to help this person and let's work together to help ourselves because we're all suffering. Be- you know, that she's suffering from anorexia, but we're suffering because we're sad and worried, you know. But most of all, patron Torleaf, don't beat yourself up about this. If nothing works and you gave it your best shot, don't beat yourself up and don't pre beat yourself up because things aren't currently working. Like I said, it's, it's such an entrenched issue. You ask, is there anything a friend can do to get through to them? Well, I think I've been answering that question. Uh, it's um, no. <laughs> uh, um, you know, there might be, but, but I wouldn't count on it. Um, you can put some effort into it, but don't, don't expect things to work. You say here, is it a lost cause? 
No, it's not a lost cause. Um, but again, you have to let go of your expectations. You can absolutely have hope and you can hope for the best, but don't attach yourself to a particular expectation like that they will get into treatment anytime soon, for example. You can have hope that they'll get into treatment, but you, but you shouldn't expect it to happen because that can be very painful when, it, when, that, when the expectation isn't fulfilled. You know, you're, you're worried that your friend's going to die, and your friend might. And that's and there might not be anything anyone can do. I mean, even if you manage to get an involuntary hospitalization or whoever can authorize that, eventually the person has to be released. And it's um, it it there just isn't a system in place in our society that really can make sure that someone doesn't destroy their life and their health in this way. But having said that, most people live. It's one of the most fatal mental disorders in the D it is the most fatal mental disorder in the DSM, but most people with eating disorders survive and most actually recover or many people recover. And it takes a lot of time and effort, but you know, most people live and many people recover. And so uh, is it a lost cause? Absolutely not. You know, it might just be a matter of time. You're, you're, you're telling me that she is very close to dying which makes me think that you should prepare yourself for such an event, which is just a terrible thing to think, right? Um, again, contact the family, contact. Um, if you're really worried, you can call crisis lines in your area and ask them if they might be able to help. It, for example, if you're the only support person and you're the only one that is near her and you think she is very close to dying, yeah, absolutely call the crisis line. Uh, you should you should have a crisis center or some kind of mental health hotline in your area that will be able to direct you to professionals that will be able to help. Uh, there might even be government professionals who can actually come out and assess really quick to see whether or not she needs to be involuntarily hospitalized. You ask, are there things one can do to raise chances of survival? Uh, this is a good question. It's hard to know. It depends on the situation. Um, so, you know, there are things you could do that we could think of that might actually make things worse because it might alienate her. You know, if you put a lot of pressure on her, that might be a bad thing or your pressure might be a good thing. So it just, it's hard to say. The main thing is, is you just want to do what you can to help the person not be isolated because isolation breeds problems. You also ask, how are eating disorders generally treated? Well, it depends on the area and the severity and the, you know, the... Uh, what the person has access to and all that stuff. But in general, in, in moderate to severe cases, there's usually, at the beginning, there's usually inpatient where they monitor every calorie and they really make sure that you eat healthy, healthily. And this can be like a, like a group home experience or even a hospital. Sometimes people are even hospitalized where they, they have a, a feeding tube that, because they refuse to eat even in inpatient treatment uh, centers. Then after you graduate from that, after you know a, a number of weeks, then there's day treatment, which is you go home at night, but you go to the day treatment center, often Monday through Friday during the day, which includes individual therapy and group therapy and medical monitoring by a medical professional who weighs you and visits with a dietitian, maybe even chemical dependency treatment if that's at play or a trauma situation, maybe DBT work, you know, the day treatment can involve a lot of different things. Then after day treatment is just regular outpatient where they might be referred to someone like me, which includes some form of therapy, uh, often group, um, often sometimes individual, along with, again, medical monitoring to weigh the person and with meetings with a dietitian, sometimes once a month. Then once the weight is stable and healthy for a number of months, then they are free or they might discharge to no treatment at all. And there is a plan for relapse because often there's relapse. And so the, the individual will develop a plan of relapse. So the person has to have stable and healthy weight for a long period of time before it is advised that they stop treatment. So all of this depends on, on a number of things. One is, is the client in general, for the vast majority of cases, the client has to be willing to do all this. 
And if the client isn't willing, then none of this will happen. There's rare instances where you can, again, get someone to be involuntarily hospitalized, but it's just for a brief period of time. So, and they're free to go pretty quickly, and then they can just slip right back into it if they want. The other thing is, is that people have to have funding for this, and they have to have access to it. I, I know people close to me right now who have children who have situations like this, and they're running into problems where there just isn't access to to funding, which is just a terrible thing, right? I mean, you have a, a disorder that is, you know, recognized by the field that is the most fatal uh, disorder you have in the DSM. And because of our stupid culture, we don't have funds to pay for treatment. So, so there's that. <laughs> All right. So the bottom line, patron Turleaf, is that it's, it's so hard to watch someone suffer. It's so hard to watch someone suffer when it feels like it's so easy for them to turn the boat around. You know, they're, they're in a boat and they're headed toward the waterfall and they're about to go over the cliff and, and you're like, there's time. All you have to do is turn it around, just turn the boat around and you can live and you can be happy and and I have the way. All you have to do is turn that boat around. All you have to do is eat. Just eat 1,000 calories a day, 1,500 calories a day. Just eat, you know, one cheese sandwich every three hours. <laughs> you know, just eat some broccoli. Just, just eat these carrots, please. Just this apple, this orange. You can eat very healthily and 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 still get the calories you need. You know, please, and to see someone suffering so much because you know they're not happy. They're not like, yay, I have an eating disorder. They're they're clearly suffering. It's so hard to watch a friend, a family member go through that. And believe me, I know how you feel. I'm a therapist. I I've been there. I, I've been at ground zero with people um, that are suffering from this or, or some other issue. And we have this notion in our society that we have the power or med- science has the power to change the situation. But the bottom line is, is the person has to want it. And that is a, a, an amorphous, elusive, uh, mysterious thing how do you get someone to want to change? How do you get someone to be willing to throw away something that they like so much? It is, it's a mystery and it happens every day. People, people make that decision every day to, um, to improve, to get healthy. Maybe they hit bottom. Maybe they have a moment of clarity Maybe they hit a critical mass in terms of the reasons to not uh, go down that road anymore. Maybe there's an inspiration that they come across. There's so many different paths to that, to that switching point. But as a friend, the, the one thing you can do is be a non-judgmental friend someone who is there to have a good time, have a laugh, listen, keep that person engaged. Uh, you know, time with friends is often uplifting and it, it'll be your tiny little part that you can do as a friend that is not hard to do. You know, sounds like you like this person. So it's, it's not hard to, to be a friend, right? Um, if you feel like you have the energy uh, connect with the support group, maybe even the professionals that may, might be helping this person. Um, I say if you have the energy because you you have to protect yourself. And as a therapist, I know this all too well as, as well. You have to protect yourself because if you drive yourself down the tubes, what good does that do? You know, uh, there's a, If you find yourself rotting from the inside from this, then you're pushing too hard and um, letting go uh, in, a, in a way might be in order. 
or scaling back or something, you know, because the, the person with the eating disorder is totally powerless. Therefore, everyone around her is even more powerless, right? So it, it's a hard thing. It's almost a grieving process to some extent where you're just like, I have to grieve the notion that I have power over situations like this. I have to grieve the notion that that modern medicine has an answer to stuff like this because it really doesn't. One day, a couple hundred years from now, my guess is, is all they need to do is give the person a pill or put that, you know, or zap their brain or something. There's, there's probably some process in the brain that they can um, reverse or something because it, it does have some neurological qualities to it, you know. Anyway, so let me know. Hopefully things go well with your friend. Um, hopefully she'll, she'll turn it around and get on a healthy path. Uh, let me know how things are going. All right. Well, I managed to answer two patrons' questions, and I have another 100 to go, so I better get cracking. But let's put an end to this episode. This uh, it was an episode of Psychology in Seattle, which is a podcast, which is hosted by me, who is now saying, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. Thank you.